We are excited to have Dr. Tim Riesenberger here with us tonight. He's uh, come up from Seattle to present to us, and we, why don't we just give him a warm tri city welcome? Good evening. Can everyone hear me okay? I'm going to share with you a little slice of the emergency room before we start. Not all of emergency medicine is trauma, heart attacks, strokes, things like that. We get the regular coughs, colds, sprained ankles. And one night I remember seeing an eight-year-old girl. And typical children problem is earache. However, this wasn't just a regular earache. I remember looking at this young girl and thinking to myself that this could be very serious. Because although otitis media or an infection in the middle part of the year can be fairly benign, there is a condition where people with diabetes can get something called malignant otitis externa. Does that sound good? Well, what's the first word that makes it sound bad? Malignant, right? You've heard that used in cancer. Something is benign or not cancer or malignant. And this condition is so deadly that oftentimes a patient has to be hospitalized. Can you imagine being hospitalized for an earache? That'd be silly. But I remember as I just looked at this young woman, I knew that I had to check her for diabetes. That brings me to our definition of diabetes. Does anyone know what diabetes is? What does it mean? What's the definition? Sure, it's a chemical imbalance. And which particular chemical are we talking about? Insulin or, I heard it, glucose. Sure, the Greek word for diabetes is based on uh, sugar. And so diabetes is an abnormality with glucose metabolism in the body. But is there only one kind of diabetes? No, many kinds. Anyone name some? Go ahead. Type 2, sure. There's type 1. Anything else? Juvenile. Insipidus. OK, all right. That's right. There's diabetes mellitus. There's diabetes insipidus. Anything else? Ah, gestational. Not everyone remembers that one. Any, anyone else can think of any diabetes? That's pretty amazing. I think you guys have gotten more than any crowd. I was just this weekend speaking at VegFest at the Seattle Convention Center for the annual Vegetarians of Washington Festival. And that crowd tends to be fairly educated, but you guys named, I think, more than most any other crowd I've heard. There's a few other types of diabetes. There's uh, nephrogenic diabetes, there's central diabetes, there's bronze diabetes even. But the ones we're going to be dealing with mainly is what would you think the, most, the two most common types of diabetes are? Sure, type 1 and type 2. And someone mentioned juvenile, right? And that's actually supposedly type 1. And adult onset is type 2. But that's what brings me to our definition. And did you know that we cannot use juvenile anymore? We can't use adult onset anymore. We have to use type 1 and type 2. In fact, we used to also say insulin what? Dependent, right? Diabetes, <coughs> mellitus. But we can't do that anymore. The reason why I'm bringing this up is this, this eight-year-old girl, I believed, had diabetes when I walked in the room. Now, the reason for that is I'll give you an example. I weigh about 190 pounds. And this girl weighed about the same as me at eight. And I tested her blood glucose, and it was high. And that is the reason why we can no longer say adult onset, juvenile onset. Because this little girl had type 2 diabetes at eight. And I have seen it in teenagers. What used to be only type 1 where the typical teenager is very thin, is urinating, is eating all the time, has blurry vision, that has become much more rare, even in the young population. We have come to the point where, in 1958, compared to now, there are 300% more diabetics in the US and Canada. 
Now, what would you suppose would be the reason for that? Diet. diet. And what in particular in our diets? Ah, carbohydrates. That's interesting. I'm so glad that we brought that up. We'll, we'll address that in just a few moments. But the reason why I'll share with you as soon as we go through what the problems of diabetes are. Because diabetes, no big deal. A little bit too much sugar in the blood, right? A little spilling over into the urine. Does that cause any health problems? Name some organ systems, some organs in the body that are affected by diabetes. Eyes. I heard the eyes. The number one cause of blindness in any industrialized nation is <coughs> diabetes. Does anyone know what the second most common cause is? Macular degeneration. Feet. feet. Now, what happens to the feet in diabetes? You, they, yes, you can, get, you can get claudication or blockages. You can get arterial blockages, which can cause the black. I think someone was saying like a black toe. But what do people with diabetes have real problems with? In fact, it's why the nurse or physician always says, now, always check your feet, right? And the reason for that is why? Nerve damage. Nerve damage. Peripheral neuropathy is what people with diabetics get. Now the problem is that the neuropathy begins usually at the longest nerves. It's further away. There's less circulation. And so the longest nerves in the body supply the toes, supply the fingers. And so you and I, if we're on a hike and we get a rock in our shoe, what do we do? We take our shoe off, right? Now, if someone with peripheral neuropathy gets a rock in their shoe, it bores a hole in their foot. And that brings me to another point. Not only does it bore a hole in someone with diabetes, but what are they more disposed to once they've got that ulcer there? Ah, infection. Because diabetes affects another system, which is the immune system. Diabetics have ravages of more infections, more complications, more need of heavier antibiotics, because their immune system just simply does not function as well. And I'm going to be sharing an exact linear relationship between blood sugar and even dietary sugar and the immune system in our next lecture about cancer. Any other systems that diabetes affects? Kidneys, absolutely, number one complication for diabetes that people usually associate it with is, oh, I had to go on dialysis. That's right. And did you know that diabetes affects the kidney so severely that the body, although it's trying to slow this damage down, if you just add a very small additional burden, you can double your risk of kidney failure. Can anyone tell me what the safest drug is on the market? Safest drug, over the counter, you can get it anywhere. Aspirin. Aspirin, not quite the safest. There's a little bleeding risk with aspirin. Aspirin. Another guess? Tylenol, sure. They have shown that people with diabetes who take Tylenol just twice a week double their risk of renal failure. Twice a week? I mean, how many of you have taken Tylenol in the last week? Sure, absolutely. It's a common medication. But it's just enough of an additional burden for the system, for the liver, for the kidneys to double that risk. Any other systems that diabetes affects? Heart. Heart. Absolutely. 80% of people with diabetes will die of a heart attack. In fact, it takes your risk of heart disease and it multiplies it by 200 to 1,200 percent. Now to give you an idea, we'll be coming to this in the next lecture, smoking cigarettes increases your risk of lung cancer by only 700 percent. Only 700 percent. <laughs> Still high, but 80 percent of people who have diabetes die of a heart attack. Absolutely. The diabetic condition ravages the blood vessels, blocks the coronary arteries. Any other systems that diabetes affects? Certainly it's a very deadly disease, yes. But is there any areas where it affects quality of life? 
circulatory. We did talk about that with the feet. I'll give you an example. When I was in medical school, I had some colleagues who were urologists. And during my time in medical school, many of them were selling their homes, selling their cars, selling lots of their assets, and they took all of their money and put them into one drug company. And in one month, they took their assets and multiplied them by 700% in one month. Do you know what drug that was? Viagra. <laughs> the number one cause of erectile dysfunction, as far as disease causes, is diabetes. Absolutely, diabetes not only affects our mortality, but our quality of life. And I can tell you that that kind of disease that affects so many organ systems is definitely important for each one of us. We're going to talk about the definitions of diabetes. When you see your doctor and they are suspicious of diabetes, what do they usually check? Your blood sugar. Sure, it can be as simple as a, a finger poke, right? And what do they usually ask you to do before you get it tested? Fast. That's right. So a fasting blood sugar of 125 or greater on two occasions points toward diabetes. Now, if they're not really sure, are there some other tests that they can do for diabetes? Anyone else know? You can test your urine, sure. You spill glucose in your urine. The urine test is not quite as accurate. So other tests they use, especially with people who are considered occult diabetics. In fact, there is an interesting phenomenon with our lab results. Have you ever noticed when you get your lab results back from your doctor, you always look at those results that say H, high or low, right? And you always want to know why. But now patients are getting all these highs on their blood sugars because the reference range used to be at that 125. The reference range now, do you know what's considered abnormal glucose? 100. Actually, yours is in millimoles. I'm sorry, that'd be difficult for you guys. It's just 100. So it's come down 25%. Now, the reason for that is that they have shown that your fasting sugar should not be greater than 100. In fact, there's some new research that has shown if your fasting blood sugar is consistently over 95, you carry the gene for diabetes. And if they want to check to see if these kind of pseudo high glucose numbers mean diabetes, they can check something called a hemoglobin A1C. Has anyone ever heard of that? It's basically the hemoglobin molecule is the iron binding molecule of the red blood cell. And if it is exposed to chronic levels of high blood sugar, you'll get a little glucose molecule kind of plastered onto it. And they check the percentage of hemoglobin that is glycosylated. And that should be less than 7.5% in the normal population. People who control their diabetes well, they also use that as a marker. Also, there's what's called a glucose tolerance test. Has anyone heard of that before? You drink, it's a fairly nasty tasting uh, beverage of glucose, and then they test your blood sugar one hour, two hours, three hours later to make sure that your body is processing the blood sugar and it brings down the glucose to a normal level at an appropriate time. Now that being said, we've got the problem of diabetes. We've got the definitions of diabetes. Now we'll talk about what I believe is the most important part of this lecture, and that is the cause of diabetes. What does everyone think about diabetes? Remember, I asked the audience earlier, and I said, what has changed from 1958 to now? Our diets have changed, and you said we're eating more carbohydrates. That is the classic answer, and I'll tell you why. Because there's an excess of what? Glucose, and glucose is a sugar. Comes from carbohydrates, right? It makes sense, but it's not true. And I'll tell you why. Any of you have children? Fair number of you. I can illustrate it this way. If you have a young child, when you sit down to eat lunch, or dinner, or any meal, and the child wants dessert first. Mommy, I want dessert. No, no, no. 
I want you to eat what first? Vegetables. Your vegetables, your meal, or even your salad, or it may be any number of things, because you're afraid as a parent that if they eat the dessert first, they're not going to have what? Appetite or room for the other more nutritional things they need to be eating. And that is exactly how it works in the cells of our bodies. For those of you who are medically related, you can look this up on PubMed or whatever search engine you like. It's called the post-receptor defect mechanism of diabetes mellitus, post-receptor defect. And the way it works is the same way as your child. If you take a cell and you expose it to large amounts of fat, either in the diet or if it is filled with fat, meaning overweight obesity, then there's not enough room for guess what? The glucose. And even though we often think that diabetics have a lack of what hormone? What do you think they have a lack of? Insulin. Insulin. Did you know that 95% of diabetics, that's not the case? Most people don't realize that. It is true, a type 1 diabetic, which is the vast minority of diabetes, they have a lack of insulin because the immune system has destroyed the islets of Langerhans, which are cells in the pancreas that produce insulin, the beta cells. But type 2 diabetics, did you know that normally type 2 diabetics have a higher level of insulin? Most people don't know that. But what they have is insulin resistance at the cellular level. The insulin is there, but it can't go where? In the cell. Now the problem with that is this. The body, although it can use fat as a fuel, it requires a minimum amount of sugar, glucose, to burn that fat. Now if it doesn't, you get into what's called diabetic ketoacidosis, which means the body breaks down fat in the absence of carbohydrate and produces as acids, acetone, um, beta-hydroxybutyrate, for those of you who are interested, acetoacetate. Now the problem is, is that most people realize that yes, diet is a component of diabetes, but sugar is not the culprit. In fact, I'm going to share with you a study that was done by Dr. James Anderson from the University of Kentucky. Very, very striking results. He took healthy subjects, healthy men in their 20s, and he was trying to see the effect of diet on glucose metabolism. And can you imagine a diet that was composed of an additional one pound of refined sugar a day? Can you imagine that? One pound, which is about 450 grams, right? I can tell you he had these subjects taking more than one pound of sucrose, which is the principal sugar, right, in refined white sugar, a day. In fact, it composed 80% of their calories. That's incredible. And he followed them two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, ten weeks. Normal glucose tolerance tests all throughout. However, what he found at the time when he modified the diets to be 65% fat. Now, does anyone know what the average fat intake is for our populations, Canada, U.S.? The, yeah, exactly. It's, it's around 40%. Their target is less than 30%. Has anyone seen Super Size Me? <laughs> now, to make this illustration forcible, average American diet, Canadian diet, is about 40% fat. Now, if you were to do the Super Size Me diet, that's a little bit more. Now, 65% though is huge. 65% of your calories from fat. In just two weeks on a 65% diet, all of the subjects had abnormal glucose tolerances tests. In fact, some of them reached the point where they had levels of 200. And I can tell you, if you have one reading of 200 at any time, it's considered diabetes. Healthy, normal subjects. 
80% sugar diet. No problem with the glucose challenge test. In fact, they showed that it was no different than a control diet. In fact, they showed it may have even been a little better. I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> but the point is, is that it's fat. And that is the cause of the vast majority of diabetes. But you see, most of us aren't aware of that. Because if we were, we'd be telling our patients, lose weight. Lose weight any way you possibly can. Because if you normalize your body weight, 95% of people would lose their diabetes. Now, am I talking about people that are brittle diabetics, type 1 diabetics? No. But the vast majority of diabetics are who? Type 2. That's right. And if only we knew this information. Because I can tell you, is the cure for diabetes, what do we typically use as physicians? Insulin, sure. It's a hormone, right? The most common drug to treat diabetes is insulin. Now, does insulin cure diabetes? Have you ever known somebody? Yeah, I took three months of insulin and my diabetes was gone. <laughs> Sorry, it doesn't work that way. It does not cure diabetes. In fact, I'm going to share with you something very interesting. If you take somebody on insulin, has anyone ever known someone who's a diabetic and they've been a diabetic for 20, 30 years? And they start complaining of episodes of low blood sugar. And they say, Doc, I'm, I'm having to back down off my insulin. I'm having to back it down and back it down. I must be getting better. Has anyone ever heard of that? Did you know that they're actually getting worse? And I'll tell you why. I have seen this many, many times in my medical practice where someone will come in and they'll say, you know, I've noticed over the last three or four weeks I've had to cut my insulin in half, even further. I must be getting better, but I can look at them and see that they're way overweight still. They're maybe in their 60s, 65, and I know that they're actually getting worse. And I will draw a blood test and the vast majority of the time I am correct, is that a blood value called creatinine is going up in them. Because remember, the number one problem for people with diabetes is many organ systems, but number one cause for dialysis, right? So the problem is, is that their kidneys are starting to fail. And what most people don't know is, do you know what organ system clears insulin? Well, the liver, yes, but the kidney, mostly. And the thing is, is if your kidney function is down, what can't it get rid of? Insulin. So when you inject it, it just kind of hangs out. And it continues to work and work and work. That's why people who are on dialysis, we can give them an injection of one antibiotic and have it last a week. Because it's just never cleared. It just recirculates and recirculates over and over again, if it's cleared by the kidney. So actually, people are losing their kidney function. But I'm going to share with you something even more insidious. Someone said that there were various types of diabetes. And there was one person, I think over here, that said there was a common type of diabetes that affects women. And what was that? Gestational diabetes. I'm going to let you in on a little secret that you already know, actually. But I'm just going to bring you a couple steps further. Did you know what the number one cause of birth trauma is? Does anyone know that? Number one cause of birth trauma. It's if the mother has something. Yes, gestational diabetes. And why would you suppose that would predispose this woman to birth trauma. What kind of babies do these women have? Are they small babies? I have seen 14, 16 pound babies. And believe me, if you try to move that out of a fixed space, you're going to have some birth trauma. These babies have what we call macrosomia. They're large. 
And do you want to know why? Why do you suppose this baby is so large? Because it is seeing an exposed amount of what hormone? Insulin. Insulin, have you ever heard of anabolic hormones, catabolic hormones? Insulin is what kind of hormone? Growth hormone, that's right. Growth hormone. These babies put on massive amounts of weight rapidly because they're seeing the maternal levels of insulin. Because remember what I told you, in type 2 diabetes, which gestational diabetes is a, is a kind, what's the insulin level like? Low? It's high. It's high. The problem is cellular resistance, right? You have a high level of insulin, but what is the cell full of? Fat. But what about the baby cell? The baby cells are normal. So when you expose this baby to more insulin, what's it going to do? It's going to just pack the cells, and it's going to be huge. Now remember, I shared with you the cause of diabetes. It's fat not only here, but in the diet. Remember the 65% fat? But what do we do when we see our patients? They come in, oh, your blood sugar's running high. I'm going to have to up your insulin. insulin. You got to lose weight. You got to lose weight. And what am I doing to you? I'm giving you a hormone that's going to do what to you? Gain weight. It is insidious. Now, am I saying there's not a time to use insulin? Of course not. I use it all the time. I see people come in in diabetic comas, and I put them on an insulin drip. But the long-term cure is not insulin. Because if you understand that the cause of diabetes is fat in you and in the diet, if you pump yourself full of insulin, it's a growth hormone. You know, I see it, and I've heard doctors beating up their patients. Why haven't you lost weight? Aren't you exercising? Have you been eating at midnight again? <laughs> no, it's because we're pumping them full of growth hormone. That's not the only cause. But you can see now why insulin will never cure diabetes. Any other treatments we use for diabetes? Metformin, metformin oral pills. And uh, we won't start with metformin. Uh, metformin is glucophage. Uh, that's our trade name. We'll start with another class of drugs like gliburide, glipizide, things like that. Those are sulfonylureas. Now, those act by encouraging the pancreas to release more insulin. Now, a side effect can be what, would you say, if you release too much insulin? Low blood sugar, right? So the problem with this is not just the low blood sugars. But I can tell you, I've gotten paramedic calls. Hey, Dr. Riesenberger. Just want to get some advice from you. I said, go ahead. Well, I got a patient here, 65-year-old, diabetic male. And um, you know, he thinks he took too much of his insulin. Uh, he's eating a meal. His blood sugar's normal. I said, what was it initially? It was 20. He was unconscious. I'm like, OK. I said, is he on any oral diabetic medications? Uh, I don't know. Can you check? And the reason why I asked that is this. Is insulin, would you say it's a long-acting or short-acting drug? Most of the time, it's short-acting. There are some ultra-lente insulins that are long-acting. But I can tell you that the half-life for some of these diabetes medications is two days. And what would you say if you had someone with a glucose that's bottomed out on these oral meds? Would you just let them eat and then go to sleep? The half-life is 36 hours, 18 hours. What's going to happen when they go back to sleep? They're going to die because of the long half-life. If they've had an accumulation of this drug because they forgot, maybe took a few extra, they'll go to sleep and they'll die. That is actually the easiest admit in emergency medicine. All I have to do is call up the guys upstairs and I said, I got a diabetic on gliburide. His blood sugar was 20. It's normal now, but we need to monitor him. They're like, oh, OK. They don't even argue because there's nothing more you're going to say. You can't have somebody wake up and just say, oh, my blood sugar's low. They may not know. That's one risk of the diabetes medications. But I'll tell you what the major concern is. With these sulfonylureas, the major concern is they actually increase the risk of heart attacks. 
Now, do you remember what most diabetics die of? 80% die of a heart attack. So again, this is not the long-term cure. Now we mentioned metformin, right? Which is glucophage. Now the problem with metformin is not that it's an issue with perhaps heart attacks or whatnot, but it has other side effects. It has a very, very serious side effect called lactic acidosis. Your doctor will check your liver enzymes and will ask you to report any muscle aches or pains. A potentially life-threatening condition. It's rare, but it happens. But again, I go back to the bottom line, is that does metformin cure anyone of diabetes? No. Medications, if you remember one thing about drugs, just remember that drugs don't cure disease. That's a pretty heavy statement coming from a physician. Drugs don't cure disease. Now there's a few exceptions. Some people would say, well, there's antibiotics and things like that. However, if someone has no immune system and you give them an antibiotic, will they be cured of their infection? No. Drugs are to help you through a short period of time. Not to keep you on them forever and ever and ever. Because the cure is restoring normal physiology to your body. What I tell people is that drugs apparently cure disease, but they change the location of the problem, by and large. Or they treat the symptoms of the condition. But to cure yourself of diabetes is not just to have normal blood sugar. Because I'll share this with you. There was a, a wonderful study done on about 35,000 people. That's a lot of people. And they found that in this group, they could eliminate a lot of what we call confounding variables. Because this is a population that doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, and half of them are vegetarian, half of them are not. Anyone know what population that is? Seventh-day Adventists, yes. And they looked at people that were diabetics and they had perfect control of their diabetes. They regulated, they took their meds, they did everything, but they remained with diabetes. If you control your diabetes perfectly, you still lose 10 years off your life. It is not something you just want to manage. You want to cure it. And I can tell you, if you forget everything else from the lecture, remember just two things. What is the cause of diabetes? Fat. Two places. Where? In the body and in the diet. And the cure for 95% of diabetes is to maintain or go back to what? Ideal body weight. And there's lots of ways of doing that. However, most of that is another lecture. But I'll give you an idea. If you have a cell that's full of fat and you want to create hunger for glucose, right? You have the child that's eaten the dessert and now doesn't want to eat the salad. How are you going to get that child to be hungry again? Get it out and exercise it. That's right. Did you know that when you exercise, one hour of exercising is equal to five units of insulin? You can go and exercise and get the same effects without the side effects. The other thing you can do is if you don't want the cell to get full of fat, stop feeding it fat. Yes. It's that simple. If you forget everything else, just remember those things. And my prayer for each one of you is that you will examine the problems that you have in your life and ask yourself first, what is the cause of this condition? And once you've identified the cause, you can identify the cure by just simply removing it. I hope that you take an approach to your own health that is different from most people's. Most people's approach is what we call an external locus of control. They blame their environment. They blame their genetics. They blame lots of things outside of them. In fact, that's common sometimes when people say, well, look, you know, my health care is taken care of. The government will pay for it. However, you want a better quality, right? Just because it's free. Yeah, you can go to the grave for free. <laughs> that's not what you want. You want to live a long time with abundant health. I'm going to take a few moments to have a break. There was going to be some refreshments. I'll be happy to take your questions 
at that time. And then we'll get ready and we'll come back and we're going to meet at 8 o'clock sharp and we will talk about cancer. We will talk about the immune system. We will talk about a story that I like to call the body triumphant. Thank you very much. Yes, and I know you guys have millimoles yes. here in Canada. I am not familiar with the equivalent. You know, I should have actually, I, I, I do know at one time, because I've been up here in Canada before lecturing, and I always try to keep the millimole to milligrams per deciliter conversion. I am not remembering it right now. I apologize. But I'm sure you could look it up on the internet. 3.3 to 6.0. 3.3 to 6.0 is the upper limits of normal for glucose. 6.0, okay. N n next question. Yeah, uh, peripheral neuropathy, is yes. there anything that can be done for it? From what? What's the cause of the peripheral neuropathy? Uh, side effect of vitropel. Oh, medication side effect. Yeah, no sugar diabetes. Oh, yeah, it's, it's hard. You know, sometimes there are certain drugs. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen, like, I'll give you an example. If you've ever seen somebody who has kind of almost a nervous tick, but it's kind of like this. And it's very, very embarrassing for them. And the problem with that is it can sometimes be as a result of long-term medications. It's called, uh, and there's other things called tardive dyskinesia, and those things never go away, unfortunately. There are certain medication risks uh, and side effects that are kind of permanent. I am not aware of how permanent that particular drug is. I'm not familiar with that drug. Uh, there are things to manage peripheral neuropathy. Um, what I tell people is the nerves regrow very slowly. Like if you cut a nerve, it grows like a millimeter a month. It's like really, really slow. There's so, that drug for less than a year. Wow, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm not familiar if it's permanent or not. Uh, I would talk I would talk with your doctor, see if there's anything you can do. What they will likely do is they will probably manage the neuropathy with a medication. Uh, what I would probably recommend from what you can do on your part is probably just like, is the neuropathy on your feet, hands? The feet, no, only the feet, the yeah. soul. What I would probably do is do a number of things. Do things that will increase circulation to your feet. And there's, there's various things you can do for that. If someone is overweight or too heavy, there's a lot of basal weight on the bottom of the feet. So losing weight will help that. Exercise will help it. Hot and cold baths will help it. But you want to be really careful with that because you don't want to burn yourself if you have a neuropathy, if that makes sense. So I would probably do stuff like that. But talk to your doctor to see if there's something um, that makes it treatable. Because I can tell you there are certain medications that cause peripheral neuropathies and they can be reversed. Like tuberculosis medications, when people get a peripheral neuropathy from that, the treatment is actually vitamin B6, and it goes away. So uh, that may be the case, probably not, if no one's done that uh, by now. But I would talk to your doctor to see if there's any way you can treat it. I'm, I'm, I'm not certain what would be the treatment for that drug. But I would say, as a general rule, less weight, increased circulation would certainly not be harmful to your nerve endings. And it might help them a little bit. Next question. I just got one sure. for the lady that had problems with her nerve endings from, I don't know what it was, from she had some cancer treatment. It was a drug, I believe, she okay, took. Well, I, I went through cancer treatment about three and a half years ago, testicular cancer, and they gave me a, a chemotherapy drug called cystoplatinum. I don't know if you're sure, I'm that. familiar with cystoplatinum. Okay, well, it was really hard on my nerves, my feet, and my fingers. And what I did is I went to a naturopath, the doctor, Intravenously give me high dosages of vitamin D and magnesium hmm. three times a week. I did that for about maybe about three months, and my nerve endings started to increase, and I had less. Well, certainly there are some neuropathies that can be due to effects of vitamins, and we did mention vitamin B6 
Um, but I would make sure, again, with all kinds of diseases, the first thing you want to find out is what is the cause, right? Because if you don't know what the cause is, you can't really treat it. You're just kind of shooting in the dark. And what I would say is if you're going to, quote, treat something, uh, whether it be from a physician or from a natural standpoint, make sure you know, A, what you have first. And remember that in healthcare, uh, it's just like any other field. Have you ever heard the saying, a little knowledge is dangerous? It's very true. Make sure whether it's a drug or whether it's a natural therapy, it is well examined in a good study that's unbiased and it shows long-term benefits. That's why the best types of studies and the ones that have a lot of power that we call in statistics are ones that look at tens of thousands of individuals. Have, have any of you seen the National Geographic magazine with a guy standing on his head? It talks about who lives the longest in the world. Have you guys seen that National Geographic article? It's a great article. I take a look at that because that is the exactly the kind of thing you want to look at because it looked at the three longest lived people in the world as far as people groups who have been, been doing it for over a hundred years. And does anyone know what those three people groups are? Go ahead. The, uh, not the Japanese, but a particular group of Japanese. The Okinawans. Yeah, the Sardinians of Europe, sure. Absolutely, and the Seventh-day Adventists. So you want to look at stuff like that because, you know, there's all kinds of stuff you can do, right? There's a potpourri. You could do, uh, you know, acupressure. You could do uh, transcendental meditation. You could do biofeedback. You could do the South Beach diet. You could do all kinds of things. But the bottom line is what people groups are getting the bottom line out of whatever they're doing. And that's the Okinawans, the Sardinians, and the Seventh-day Adventists. And I'll tell you why there's a very important difference between those three groups. Because the Okinawans live where? But on an island of Japan, right? So if you're looking at that kind of population, their benefits for longevity could be due to what? Location, because they're only in one place, right? You could have the people who founded the island be people who lived to 120. And so the genetic line is what? going to be passed on to all the rest of the Okinawans. The other thing is the same thing with Sardinia. Now, it's not quite as restrictive, but it's a people group in a area, right? Now, the reason why I recommend people to follow what the Seventh-day Adventists are doing is because when they look at Seventh-day Adventists, where are they? Everywhere. Everywhere. And that is the issue. You don't have a confounding variable of genetics or location that may be giving you that benefit to that lifestyle. But if you look at the magazine and look at the Seventh-day Adventists, the Seventh-day Adventists are a group of like 15 million people who live everywhere. You know? So their benefit is not due to location. It's not due to genetics, right? It's going to be due to lifestyle, which is what you and I all want to figure out, right? What lifestyle changes are going to give me the best quantity and quality of life? Okay. I can tell you this, is that, how would I put it? I am not aware of the, I think someone else asked about pH. I am not aware of the effects of a pH type of diet or water as its effects on health. Now obviously pH is something very important. The body functions in a very tight range of pH. So it's important to maintain that pH. However, the body has a lot of buffer systems and it's very hard to overcome those buff buffer systems unless you have like disease. So as far as the alkaline water versus the acid water, whatever, I can't really answer that question. There may be some benefit, uh, but I'm not certain. But what I will recommend just as a general rule to most people is understand that <coughs> most therapies that are going to be beneficial in the long term are things that are available to everyone, are things that are available everywhere, and ultimately those are going to be the things that people can put into practice, right? Because if you say somebody can only eat Tahitian noni, right? Not all of us can get Tahitian noni, right? And I'm not saying it's bad, 
But I'm just saying that if we can only get health from this root that grows in Tibet, and you have to pay a visit to the Dalai Lama or something like that to go get it, you know, not all of us can get it, right? And so what I recommend to people is if you understand that health is not restricted to socioeconomic class, health is not restricted to location, health is not restricted to race or religion or anything like that. But I believe with all my heart that the good Lord has given us access to health wherever we are. And you'll see that even in foods. Like there are certain foods that grow in winter climates that are high in vitamin A. There are other foods in hot tropical climates that are also high in vitamin A, but they're different foods. So I would say this, if you're looking at different natural remedies especially, just keep in mind a couple things. Is it what has proven to work over long periods of time? And that's where the studies come in like on the Sardinians, the Okinawans, the Adventists. And what is available to everyone? Also another question is that whoever's recommending it, do they have a financial gain to sell it to you? I can tell you right now, I am not paid to do this or give you recommendations. I am not selling you a supplement by Dr. Riesenberger or anything like that. I'm just telling you what I believe to be sound, rational, simple, and effective ways to improve your health. Not because I'm trying to gain anything from it, because I want to see you all well.